Good day, grade 11s. Welcome to this next lesson in physical science. Um, as you may remember, last week, Thursday, we started the lesson, and then unfortunately, for some reason, the Skype call just went offline and I couldn't get back on. So what we're going to do is we're going to start where we left off and we're going to carry on with the intermolecular forces in the chemistry of water. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going through that with you and then we're going to move on to geometric optics, which is quite exciting for me. But let's go through these questions because they are important exam questions. They are old exam paper questions um, that I've taken from the exemplars as well as from um, the national papers. Okay, so it says, the graph below shows the boiling points of the hydrides. Now remember a hydride is something that is joined onto hydrogen of group six in the periodic table versus their relative molecular masses. So there is, this is the boiling point and this is their relative molecular mass. And you can see that water Amazingly, it has got a very high boiling point compared to hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen selenium, and hydrogen tellurium. Sorry, I struggled with that. Okay, now it says from the above, deduce and then write down the name and of the hydride with the weakest intermolecular forces. Now, please note, grade 11, that it's incredibly important that if they say write down the name, you write down the name, you don't just write down H2S. Okay, and the correct answer is H2S, but we'll talk about that now. Okay, because sometimes they'll say write in the name or the formula. Cool, no problem. But if they ask you to write down the name, you write down the name. You won't get a mark for just writing down the formula. Right, now it says from the graph above, deduce which of these will have the weakest intermolecular forces? So obviously the one with the lowest boiling point is going to have the weakest intermolecular forces because it means that the weak forces are going to be so weak that it will be very easily to separate these molecules out into the gas phase. So therefore this year is hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide. Okay, and no, I'm not making this mistake by writing it with an F, unfortunately, or well, fortunately for some people, but unfortunately for me, I kind of like the pH. The international people in charge of the International Association for Chemists um, has decided that this correct spelling for sulfur and sulfide and sulfates will from now on be with an F and not a pH. With hydrogen bonds between molecules, okay, it says decide and then write down the name of the hydride with hydrogen bonds between the molecules. So hydrogen bonds are very strong intermolecular forces, okay, they are very strong, which means that you're going to have a nice, strong, high boiling point, you're going to have a high boiling point. And the correct answer is going to be water, water. Also, I'm hoping you remember that hydrogen bonding occurs, hydrogen bonding, I'm going to write it up here, occurs between hydrogen and a small, highly electronegative atom. And for you guys, those atoms are oxygen, fluorine, and nitrogen. If you have any other type of bonding with, with those, it doesn't count, okay? So in other words, hydrogen with oxygen, hydrogen with F, and hydrogen with N will always give you hydrogen bonding. So if you look here, this is tellurium, this is selenium, this is sulfide, and obviously this is oxygen. So that's the dude that's got the hydrogen bonds. Now it says, which one of these requires the most energy to undergo the phase change? Well, it again is going to be the water, because the higher the temperature, obviously the more energy that's required, to change from a liquid to a gas. Right, now it says refer to the intermolecular forces and energy and give a reason why one of the hydrides in group 6 deviates from the trend in boiling point observed in the others. So what they're really asking is to explain why water 
Well, it's obviously water that we have to worry about because all the others follow this beautiful trend. Okay, there's hydrogen sulfide and they're going up in more or less a straight line and they're starting at minus, oh, what is that? It's about minus 61, minus 62, up, down, up to zero. Okay, but there is water sitting with a boiling point of 100 degrees. So it is obviously deviating from the trend. It is not fitting in with the trend. So now we need to talk about intermolecular forces energy and give a reason why this water molecule reacts differently. Now, this, these answers here basically are giving you hints as to how to answer this. So quite candidly, as far as I'm concerned, they were kind of nice to give you this. I would just pitch in with given this question yeah, because I'm not such a nice person when it comes to sitting exams, I would say do this and you would have to mention quite a lot of this. OK, so I would say, well, and I'm going to write it out in point form. Um, obviously, you don't write it out in point form, but I want to actually carry on with this lesson. So I'm going to write that in point form. OK, so what I would say is obviously it is the water molecule that deviates. OK, so you need to tell them which one you're talking about because they don't say about water. They say refer to the intermolecular force and energy. Give a reason why one of the hydrates deviate. So you need to say that you notice that water deviates. You need to say the reason for this is that it has hydrogen bonding compared with, CF means compared, compared with the weak van der Waal forces found between the other molecules, other molecules, okay. So now we've mentioned that it's got the nice hydrogen bonds, okay. Then you can say hydrogen bonding is much stronger, therefore requires or needs much more energy to change phase. Okay, so then you always go back and check to see if you answered it. It's referred to intermolecular forces, check, and energy, check, and give a reason why one of the hydrides, check, Okay, we've done all of it. So we have answered this question. We've said that water is the one that deviates. Why does it deviate? Because it has hydrogen bonding between its molecules compared to the weak fund of all forces that the other molecules have. And hydrogen bonding is much stronger and therefore requires much more energy for so that the water, the water can change phase from a liquid to a gas. Okay, um, that's basically what you need to write. Obviously, you need to write it in a nice sentence form and you can't write water as H2O. You need to actually write out the word water. Okay, now let's look at another example. Okay, it says when compared to other liquids, water has some unique physical properties. So you can see that we're now talking about the chemistry of water. Do you remember I taught you about all about water? chemistry of water. We had a whole specific lesson just about the chemistry of water. It says, okay, now it's got some unique physical properties. It is a high specific heat capacity, a high heat of vaporization, but has a low viscosity and water acts as a solvent for some substances. Okay, it says name the intermolecular, intermolecular forces that are responsible for the high specific heat capacity and high heat of vaporization of water. OK, so first of all, let's talk about what high specific heat capacity is and high heat vaporization. The high specific heat capacity, specific heat capacity, what that is, is that water can absorb a lot of heat before it evaporates or become boils. OK, in other words, what it's saying is it has a high boiling point. OK, water can absorb a lot of heat before it changes phase. High heat of vaporization is the same thing. So 
what well not high heat it's not exactly the same thing high specific heat capacity says that water can absorb a lot of temperature so remember when we spoke about the chemistry of water we said that the water um, the oceans regulated the climate of the world because what would happen is that water would take a long time to heat up okay but then it holds that heat for quite a long time before it lets it go or lets it go very slowly so in other words especially the ocean you'll find that the temp days will be quite mild because it'll take a long time for the water to heat up okay so it isn't a sharp change but then even if the land temperature drops the temperature in the water will stay warm for quite a lot longer and if you guys have ever been swimming in the evening after a couple of hot days you will notice that the water temperature is actually very warm compared to the outside air and the reason is because the water holds onto its heat or its temperature for a very long time and that's really what high specific heat capacity is it's that it takes a long time to get hot or warm but then it holds on to that heat for a long time High heat of vaporization is the fact that it takes, it's got a very high temperature, the boiling point is very high, it's 100 degrees Celsius. That doesn't seem that high, but if you look at the other um, elements or molecules in the same group when we just did that in the last question, it is actually very high. And the reason for all of that is hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. Okay, now it says draw a Lewis diagram for the water molecule. So guys, you really should have your periodic tables with you. Um, but I'm really hoping you know that hydrogen is in group one and that oxygen is in group six. Okay, so we start off with the central atom and the central atom is oxygen. So it goes oxygen and then remember, because it's in group six, it has six valence electrons. So it's going to be one, two three, four, five, and six. We need there's a gap over here and a gap over here. So I'm going to put the hydrogen in here and I'm going to put a hydrogen in here. There you go. So do you see that what happens is you've got two, just for the, just for the talking about it, you've got two unshared pairs of electrons and then you've got two shared pairs of electrons. These two unpaired shared of electrons actually repel the shared pairs of electrons more strongly. So that's why it has an angular shape. An angular shape. Okay. Right. And there is the Lewis diagram. Now it says, are water molecules polar or non-polar? Explain your answer by referring to electronegativity and to the charge distribution of water. Okay, so again, you guys really need to have your periodic tables near you. But I will tell you that the electronegativity of oxygen is 2.5 and the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.1. Okay, so what does that mean? That means, I'm just going to check that, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. That means that that is... I think that's wrong. I'm going to check it. But basically, the reason that I say that you should have, this is why you should have your periodic tables out. Um, sorry, I should have checked that this question uses electronegativity. But let me just check, check quickly. Um, oxygen is 3.5. There we go. Oxygen is 3.5. Sorry. So oxygen is 3.5. It's carbon. It's 2.5. Okay. The reason I knew that was because I know that water molecules polar covalent and it wouldn't have been polar covalent with 2.5 and 2.1. Okay. So the electronegativity difference, difference is equal to 3.5 minus 2.1 which gives you 1.4 which means that this is going to be polar covalent polar covalent okay so yes it is polar so that is to do with electronegativity. Now let's talk about the charge distribution. Okay, because oxygen has got a higher electronegativity than hydrogen, what happens is if you draw this out very basically, 
okay? Yeri is your oxygen, Yeri is your hydrogen, and Yeri is your hydrogen. Okay, what happens is that the oxygen attracts the electrons to it, okay? So what happens, the electrons from the hydrogen, for example, are going to spend a lot more time traveling around the oxygen molecule than they are against around the hydrogen. So oxygen becomes slightly negative, and the hydrogen atoms, which are effectively now hydrogen ions, or not really, but they are atoms with the electrons flowing through on the other side, are slightly positive. So what happens if I am the size of a water molecule and I had to come look at the water molecule from this side, I would see, oh look, it's slightly positive. But if I had to go and look at it from this side, I would see it as slightly negative. So that's the charge distribution. Okay, now it says, which one of the following two substances, KCl or I2, will be soluble in water? Okay, so the cool thing is that I know that this is polar covalent, right? The potassium, so do you agree that I2 is nonpolar? Nonpolar. Because of the fact that it is a diatomic molecule, which means it perfectly shares its electrons. And because of that, I don't even have to look at the electronegativity of potassium chloride. I just know that potassium chloride is going to be soluble in water. Okay, but let's go have a look. Potassium has got an electronegativity of 0, 0,8. And chlorine has an electronegativity of 3. So the difference for that is going to be, what, 2.2, so that's ionic, which means it will dissolve in a polar covalent because polar covalent and ionic are basically both got poles and like dissolves like. Okay, so I hope you understand that, but you could have got away without knowing the electronegativity by just going, well, it's pretty obvious that I2 is nonpolar. So that won't be soluble in water. So the correct answer has to be KCL. Right, last question with respect to intermolecular forces and the chemistry of water. And then we will move on to geometric optics, okay, which I love. I love the section of geometric optics. Okay, now it says the table below shows data containing three organic compounds represented by letters A, B, and C during a practical chemical investigation. So we've got organic compounds, A, B, and C. If we look at it, do you see the sort of carbons and hydrogens? This is carbons and hydrogens with OH. This is carbons, hydrogens with oxygens. The relative molecular masses are almost identical. There's 58, 60, and 60. But the boiling points are quite different. This is minus 1.5, 97, and 118. Okay, so it says, what proof is there in the table that indicates that intermolecular forces between the molecules of A are weaker than those between the molecules of C? Well, do you see that the boiling point of A is minus 0.5 degrees Celsius, whereas the boiling point of C is 118 degrees Celsius? Therefore, it's pretty obvious that A has to have much weaker intermolecular forces than C. So this is what proof? And the proof would be the boiling points. But obviously, you wouldn't just write boiling points. You would say, well, the boiling point of A is much lower than the boiling point of C. Explain why the intermolecular forces between the molecules of A are weaker than those molecules of C. Well, if you look at C, there is nothing very interesting, I mean A, there's nothing very interesting, it's just a whole bunch of carbons and hydrogens. Whereas if you look at C, you can see there's carbons, hydrogens, and oxygen. So obviously there must be hydrogen bonding. In C, okay, therefore, um, it's stronger than the weaker intermolecular forces, the weaker van der Waals forces in A. Okay, now it says explain why the boiling point of A is lower than that of B. Refer to type and strength of intermolecular forces and to vapor pressure in your answer. Okay, well, do you see that there is very definitely um, an oxygen joined up to a hydrogen in B, okay, whereas A has no 
oxygens and that. So it says now explain why the boiling point in A is lower than that of B. Refer to the strength of intermolecular forces and to vapor pressure in your answer. Okay. So what we can say is that B has got hydrogen bonding. Okay. Therefore, it has got stronger intermolecular forces than A. Therefore, A will have a lower boiling point, much lower boiling point. Okay, and that's to do with intermolecular forces. Now let's talk about the vapor pressure. Now remember, vapor pressure is actually the pressure caused by the gas as it is. Okay, let me just explain it to you this way. Okay, so do you remember that you had a container? Okay, and in the container you've got a liquid. As the liquid evaporates, it will have energy, just enough energy to become a gas or in the gas phase, but then it sits just above the surface, okay? And as it sits just above the surface, it causes pressure on that surface, and that is called vapor pressure. So obviously we can say that the vapor pressure of A is much higher than B than on B because of the fact because the boiling point is so much lower. Okay, so there's less energy required to break up those bonds. Now it says, by considering the intermolecular forces, select either A and B for the most soluble in carbon tetrachloride. Explain your answer. Well, carbon tetrachloride looks like this. It's a carbon with a chlorine and a chlorine and a chlorine and a chlorine. So it is definitely non polar because no matter which way you go you can just see chlorines okay a has got weak van der Waals forces whereas b has got hydrogen bonding so do you agree that what we are going to be dissolving into this is definitely going to be a it says which variable was controlled during this investigation? Well, obviously it was the relative molecular mass. They even mentioned at the beginning that they tried to keep the regular molecular mass the same. Now it says write down a suitable investigation, investigative question for this practical investigation. Okay, so what are we trying to do? It says the table shows data collected for three organic compounds represented as ABC during a practical and chemical. It says what proof is the table of intermolecular forces? Okay, so we want to know write down a suitable investigative question for the practical investigation. So I would say it would be how does the structure of the organic compound affect the boiling point. Okay, how does the structure of the organic compound affect the boiling point? Because it's not the molecular mass, okay, so it's definitely what is in it. Now, what is the dependent variable? The dependent variable is the one that we measure, and the independent variable is the one that we change. So in this case, the dependent variable is the boiling point, and the independent variable, which we change, is going to be the organic compound, the organic compound. Because you'll notice that the relative molecular masses remain more or less the same, but the actual organic compound changes. Okay, now let's talk geometric optics. Okay, so you've spoken about optics a little bit before in grade 10. Um, you should have, in fact, in fact, this is a lot of this that I'm going to talk about now is revision of what you guys learned about in grade 10. So first of all, you need to understand the light rays are lines which are perpendicular to the wavefronts. You guys know this, you need to think of light waves like water waves, okay, they are moving along in a specific direction, but the actual direction of the wave is 
perpendicular to the direction of the movement of the particle. In other words, let me explain what I've just said. In a water wave, if you want to think about it this way, the water wave is moving along in that direction. Okay, the particles are actually being shifted in that direction, right? But the actual little particles are going up and on and up and down. So even though the wave is moving perpendicularly, the particle itself is being moved from left to right, okay? So that is a water wave. Now it's saying that light rays are lines that are perpendicular to the light wave fronts. Okay, so if you want to think of this as the crest, and that's the crest, and that's the crest, and this is the crest, you can think of those each as wave fronts. Okay, so as the wave front goes forward, we could draw using a straight line arrow. Okay, straight line with an arrow, we could draw the direction of that wave. Okay, and that's what's happening here. Light rays are these lines which are perpendicular to the light wave fronts. In geometrical op op optics, we represent light rays with arrows with straight lines. So in other words, if I have the sun, I know that the sun is giving off light rays like this, okay? But if we do that, you guys would all think I'm crazy and that the sun's giving off some sound of some sort. So what we do is, and I can't possibly draw three-dimensional um, arrow, I mean wave, okay? So what we do is we draw arrows okay so we're saying that the light is being given off in this case in all directions okay ray diagrams is a drawing that shows the path of the light rays so light rays are drawn as straight lines with arrow heads okay pretty obvious right so what does that mean here yeah? it means let me just change color hmm. okay so this is an example of reflection Okay, so what happens is, and you need to understand this, the light comes in from the sun, okay, gets absorbed, reflected, refracted, whatever. But then, as far as our eyes are concerned, the light comes from the tree, hits the water, and then amazingly is reflected back to the eye. Similarly, yeah, we've got light ray coming from the top of the tree and gets reflected on this part of the lake and gets bounced into our eye, okay? But here's the tricky thing, the eye, the brain thinks that light travels in straight lines, okay? It doesn't have any perception or idea of the fact that this light might have bent around a corner, okay? In that case, what happens is the light is going to assume that it travels, the eye is going to assume that the light travels as a straight line. And what you end up with is a reflection. You get, well, not really a reflection, you get a mirror image of what is actually being shown. So this is your tree and this is the image, okay? And depending on how far or close you get to it, this image could be bigger than or smaller than or identical to the regular picture that you would normally see. So that there are ray diagrams. All of these are ray diagrams. Right. Now let's talk about reflection. Okay, so this is just a pretty picture showing the reflection of these beautiful pink cranes. Okay, and it's quite cool to see how beautifully they reflect it. Okay, what you need to understand about reflection, the most important thing you need to understand is that the angle of incidence has to equal the angle of reflection. Otherwise, this is not a reflected ray. Okay, and it's not pure reflection. Now you need to understand that they're different surfaces and this can only work on a beautiful flat surface. You obviously, if you guys had to take some tin foil and scrunch it up, okay, and then shine a light on it, obviously the light is going to be diffused because it's going to be reflected in all different directions. So that's not going to help. But if you took a beautiful, shiny, flat, perfectly flat mirror or whatever, and you shine a light on it, then what are you expecting? You're expecting a beautiful reflection over here. Okay, so you need to understand that this happens only when we have a beautiful flat surface, hence the water looking like glass, okay? You have what is called the incident ray. The incident ray is the light coming in, okay? 
That is at angle theta to the normal, where the normal is perpendicular to the surface. The normal is always perpendicular to the surface. Then you've got the reflected ray, and that is at theta r, okay, at an angle theta r from the normal. Now, what's important as reflection is that the angle of incidence has to equal the angle of reflection. The angle of incidence has to equal the angle of reflection. It's very important. I don't know why it does this. Reflection. Okay, so that there is reflection. Right, now, everyday uses of reflection. So this is kind of a more slightly old-fashioned version of the use of reflection. And this would be, for example, a periscope or even a... Um, basic, okay, let's start with the periscope. So what happens is, let's pretend that you're looking at a bunch of flowers. And then what happens is the light ray comes from your object travels in a straight line, hits this pretty surface, which in this case is a mirror, maybe a glass prism, okay, it gets diverted down to here where it's reflected again into the eye of the beholder, okay, the eye that the, of the person watching, okay, so that is an everyday use of um, reflection, okay. Now you get what is called total internal reflection and we will speak some more about total internal reflection yeah we will speak some more about it um, but what you need to understand is that it's very useful so what is happening here is light is coming in and hitting the glass boundary and it gets reflected over here and then hits the glass boundary again and gets reflected, gets reflected, gets reflected. Now, why is that not just something pretty that happens and actually not something important? The reason it's important is because we must remember that this is an electromagnetic wave and the electromagnetic wave can carry information. So this is used in fiber optics, okay? And I don't know how many of you actually know about fiber optics or you've just heard about it. Okay, fiber optics is a very fast way to transfer information. It's actually information that is transferred at light speed, okay? So you need to understand that what is happening is the light is coming in, it's hitting a barrier, been, and we'll explain about this total internal reflection later on in this lesson. If we don't finish today, we'll do it tomorrow. I mean, next time I see you, which is Thursday. Okay, so what happens is the light comes in, it hits this barrier and gets reflected. At this point here, it hits this barrier, which in turn is reflected, etc., etc. Okay, so it can travel along. So this is an example of light that's just traveling along this glass object, okay? But what happens with fiber optics is that you have information that is sent through an electromagnetic wave and it travels like i said at this angle bouncing along okay and what's nice what i like about this diagram is the fact that you can see that the red tube is lit up okay but that the light beam is not escaping there's no light beam here or here or here the light beam is hitting this surface reflected up reflected down reflected up etc etc so all that information that is carried by this light ray here, or uh, let's call it transverse wave electromagnetic radiation is going to be transferred without almost any loss okay and that is one of the uses of your fiber optics okay let's talk absorption okay what you guys should know by now but i will explain it to you is that light um the color we see is the color that's reflected so in for example in this picture you've got all the white light is coming in so the white light is made up of red orange yellow green blue indigo violet right made up of all the color so all of that light gets absorbed by the green surface whether it be oh excuse me sorry um i'm trying not to sneeze sorry <laughs> i've got hay fever because of the season okay so when light comes in 
it hits the green surface, okay? All the other parts of the rainbow, the red, the orange, the yellow, the blue, the indigo, and the violet, get absorbed into, all that energy gets absorbed into the object, the green surface. Only the green light is reflected, and that's how we get to see the green light. Okay, so everything else is absorbed. Okay, now you might think, well, if it's absorbing light, why doesn't it suddenly start vibrating? Well, it all depends on the frequency of that light. Okay, and if it's quite a low frequency, it means it's going to have low energy, and then it doesn't matter if that um, plant or light or object is being absorbed in the energy. So, for example, this is part of the reason that leaves go brown in um, autumn. It's because, if depending on the type of tree it is, obviously, because what happens is the light stimulates that leaf to produce chlorophyll the whole way through the summer, okay? And then what happens is it does it by absorbing all the energy, all the light. But it will still be reflecting the green light because the plants will still be green, okay? And then what happens is that during this time, obviously the cells are affected by all the light that it's absorbed, okay, and eventually they will go brown. Okay, we'll talk about that some other time when we'll be talking about energies. Okay, so transition, transmission. Transmission is when light is, goes through an object, okay? But now what we've done is something slightly different. We're saying that there's incident light where there happens to be a red, a green, and a blue light that are shone onto this pink object, okay? But it obviously is a translucent object. So then what happens is obviously the red continues to go through. Red is not um, affected by the pink. However, if you've got the light green, and you pass, try and pass it through the pink object, you will notice that it eventually gets fully absorbed. And similarly, the instant light that's blue is going to be similarly absorbed into this object. Okay, so what is the only light energy that is transmitted is the red light ray. So that just shows you that transmission occurs and with all types of um, all type of surfaces that allow light through, um, there is going to be some loss, okay? And it totally depends on the transparency of the object. Right, let's talk about the speed of light. So the definition of this is the speed of light C is constant in a given medium and has a maximum speed in a vacuum of three times by 10 to the eight meters per second. Okay, so we take the speed of light to be a constant of three times by 10 to the eight meters per second, okay? So we're assuming that light travels very close to the speed of light in other words, let me try again. We are assuming that light travels in the Earth's atmosphere at so close to the speed of light in a vacuum that we just leave it as three times by 10 to the eight. It's only when we're trying to get light to travel through something very, very thick and gloopy that the light will make a huge difference. But refraction occurs due to the slowing down of light in a slightly thicker medium, a slightly thicker medium. So if you look over here, it's quite a cool diagram. You've got a straw that has been placed in a glass of water. And what has happened is refraction. And refraction, the better word for refraction is the bending of light, the bending of light. And what has happened here is that the light has because of the fact that light travels more slowly through water than it does through air, it actually has called the, caused the bending of the light rays, which makes the um, straw look disjointed. So if the light ray hits the boundary at an angle which is not perpendicular to or parallel to the surface, then it will change direction and appear to bend. Okay.
So we've also seen pictures where the straw will actually look like it's doing this, for example. Okay, totally depends on the way it's looking. What is important though is that if your object is hitting the surface at 90 degrees, if the ray is hitting the surface at 90 degrees to the surface, then there will be no refraction. It has to be at an angle. There'll be no refraction if it's 90 degrees. Okay. Right, and that's it for today. We will continue with talking about refraction and the bending of light rays as it goes from less optically dense to more optically dense media in the next lesson on Thursday. Have a great day.